Hello everyone and welcome back to my stream. Today I'm going to get right back into reading The Charwoman's Shadow by Lord Dunsany. So let's get right into it. Chapter 3 The Charwoman Tells of Her Loss As Ramon Alonso supped, as Ramon Alonso supped, that tall figure of magic stood opposite without moving, and spoke no more, so that the young man ate hastily and soon had finished. He rose from the table. The other signed with his arm and passed out of the room, Ramon Alonso following. Soon they came to a lanthorn, which the master of the art took down from its hook on the wall. He turned then away from his green door and led his visitor on to the deeps of his house. And it seemed to Ramon Alonso, with the curious insight of youth, as he followed the black bulk of the master of the art, looming above the wild shadows that ran from the lanthorn, that here was the master of a band of shadows leading them home into their native darkness. And so they came to an ancient stairway of stone, that was lit by narrow windows opening on the stars, though tonight the master brought his lanthorns to light it in honor of his guest. And it was plain even to Ramon Alonso, from the commotion of the bats, that though he had not the art to read the surprise in the eyes of the spiders, that the light of a lanthorn seldom came that way. They came, to a door that no, they came to a door that no spell had guarded from time. The magician pushed it open and stood aside, and Ramon Alonso entered. At first, he, at first he only saw the huge bulk of the bed, but as the lanthorn was lifted into the room, he saw the ruinous panels along the wall, and then the light fell on the bedclothes. And then the light fell on the bedclothes, and he could see that blankets and sheets moldered all in one heap together, and a cobweb covered them over. Some rush mats lay on the floor, but something seemed to have eaten most of the rushes. Over the window, a drowned flapped remnants of curtains. But the moth must have been in those curtains for ages and ages. The master spoke with an air of explanation, almost perhaps of apology. Old age comes to all, he said. Then he withdrew. Left alone with the starlight, to which the work of the moth allowed an ample access, Ramon Alonso considered his host. The room was ominous, and the house enchanted, and there might well be spells in it more powerful than his sword. Yet if his host were friends, yet if his host were friendly, it seemed to him that he was safe amongst his enchantments, unless some rebel spirit should trouble the knight, who had revolted from the spells of the magician. He generously accepted the master's explanation of the state of the room, shrewdly considering him to be a man so absorbed in the perpetuity of his art that he gave no attention to material things. So, trusting to his host's expressions of goodwill and of gratitude to his grandfather, he lay down on the bed to sleep, untroubled by fear of spells or spirits of evil. But he took off none of his clothes, for against the risk of damp he felt there was none to guard him. Either he slept, or was in that borderland where earth is dimmed by a haze from the land of sleep, and dreams cast shadows yet on the shores of earth before they glide afar, when he heard slow steps come up the stairway of stone. And presently there was a knock, to which he answered, and a crone appeared in the door, holding the lanthorn that the magician had lately carried. Age had withered her beyond pity, for where... For whatever pity there be for sickness and hurts, youth feels little pity for age, having never known it, and the aged have little pity to give to their fellows, because pity is withering in them with many another emotion, like the last of the flowers drooping all together as winter nears the garden. She stood there, feeble and wasted, an ancient hag. And before the young man spoke, she, quiv she quavered to him with an earnest intentness the fervor, the fervor of which not even her age could dim, stretched out a withered right hand to him as she spoke, the left hand holding the lanthorn. Young master, give him nothing. Give him nothing, whatever he ask. His prices are too high, young master, too high, too high. I have little money to give, said Ramon Alonso. Money, she gasped, for her vehemence set her panting. Money, that is not... That's a toy, that's a mouse trap. Money indeed, but his prices are too high. He asks more than money. More than money, Sir Ramon Alonso. What then? 
Look! She cried lamentably and twirled the lanthorn about her. The young man saw first her face and a look on it, and a look on it like the look on the face of one revealing a mortal wound. And then, as she swung the lanthorn round, he suddenly saw that the woman had no shadow. What? No shadow? He blurted out, sitting suddenly up on his heap of cobwebs and sheets. Never again, she said. Never again. It lay over the fields once. It used to make the grass such a tender green. It never dimmed the buttercups. It did no harm to anything. Butterflies might have been scared of it, and once a dragonfly. But it never did them... But it did them never a harm. I've known it protect anemones a while from the heat of the noonday sun, which had otherwise withered them sooner. In the early morning it would stretch away beyond our garden, right out to the wild, poor innocent shadow that loved the grey dew, and in the evening it would grow bold and strong and run right down the slopes of hills where I walked singing. I would come to the edges of bosky tangle places till a little more, and its head would have been out of sight. I've known the fairies then dance out from their sheltered arbors in the deeps of briar and thorn and play with its curls, and for all its rovings and lurkings and love of mystery, it never left me of its own accord, never. It was I that forsook it, poor shadow, poor shadow that followed me home, for I've been out with it when the evenings were eerie and all the valleys haunted, and my shadow must have met with such companions as were far more kin to it than my gross body could be and nearer to it than my hills, folk that would give it news direct from the kingdom of shadows and gossip of the dark side of the moon, and would whisper things that I could never have taught it. Yet it always came home with me, and at night by candlelight in our cottage in Aragona it used to dance for me as I went to bed, all over the walls and ceilings, poor innocent shadow. And if I left a low candle to burn away, he never tired of dancing for me as long as I sat up and watched. Often he outtired the candle. For the more wearily the candle flickered, the more nimbly he leaped, and then he would lie and rest in any corner with the common shadows of humble trivial things, but if I struck a light to rise before dawn, or even if I should light my candle at midnight, he was always there at once, erect on the wall, ready to follow me wherever I went, and to bear me that companionship as I went among men and women, which I valued, alas, so little when I had it, and without which now I know, too late I have learned, there is no welcome for one, no pity, no sufferance amongst mankind. No pity, said Ramon Alonso, moved deeply to pity himself by the old crone's sorrow, though unable to credit that her loss could matter so much as she said. No pity, no sufferance, she said. The children run for me screaming. Those that are large enough to throw, throw stones at me, and their elders come out with sticks when they hear them scream. At evening they all grow angrier. They come out with their long, big, faithful shadows, if I dare go near a village, and stand just beyond the strip where my, sa where my shadow should be, and jeer at me, and upbraid, and there is no pity. And all the while they jeer, there's not one that loves the shadow as I love mine. They do not gaze at their shadows or even turn to look at them. Ha! Ah, how I should gaze at mine if I could come, if it could come back. Poor shadow. I should go to a quiet place alone in the open country, and there I should sit on the moss with my back to the sun and watch my shadow all day. I should not want to eat or drink or think. I should only watch my shadow. I should mark its gentle movement that it makes in time with the sun. I should watch till I saw it grow. And then I would hold up my hand and move every finger and each joint of my arm and see the shadow answering, answering, answering. And I should nod to it and bow to it and curtsy, and I would dance to my shadow alone. And all this I would do again and again all day, and I would watch the color that every flower took, and each different kind of grass when my shadow touched them. And this is not telling you one hundredth part of it. It is this to love one's shadow. And what do they know of their shadows? What do they care whether their shadows lie on green grass or rock? What do they know what colors the flowers turn when their shadows go amongst them? And they won't let me live with them, speak with them, or pass them by, because forsooth I have been unkind to my shadow. Ah, oh, well, perhaps the days will come when they too will love something too late, and love something that is gone as I love my shadow. Cold days and long days, those. How did you lose it? asked Ramon Alonso, all wonder and pity. He took it, she said. He took it! He took it away and put it in his box! What did I know of the need one has of a shadow? That they would not speak to me, would not let me live. They never told me they set such store by their shadows. Nor do they! Nor do they! The young man's generous feelings were moved by this wrong as though it had been his own. 
I will go there with my sword, he exclaimed, and they shall speak with you courteously. For the first time that night, the old woman smiled. She knew that jealousy, she knew that jealousy, united with fear, could not be made to forgive such a loss as hers. She had not known at first that it was jealousy, but had learned it at length by her lonely ponderings. The villagers saw that in some curious way she had stepped outside boundaries that narrowed them, and had escaped from one rule from which they had never a holiday. They could never be rid of the hourly attendance of shadows, but one that could but one that could should not triumph over them. She knew, and she smiled. Young master, she said, more than ever moved to help him by his outbursts of generosity. Give him nothing. But you, he said, did you give it to him? Fool, fool that I was, she said. I did not know I needed it. But for what did you give it? He asked. For immortality of a sort. She said, and said so ruefully, with a look that told so much more, that the young man saw clearly enough it had been the gift of Tithonus. "'He gave you that?' he exclaimed. "'That!' she said. "'But why?' asked Ramon Alonso. "'He wanted a charwoman,' she said. Chapter 4 Ramon Alonso Learns a Mystery Known to the Reader when the crone had revealed the mean and trivial purpose for which the master of the art had cast her helpless upon the ages, she voiced her regrets no more, but, once more warning the young man against the magician's prices, she turned about with her lanthorn and went shadowless out of the room. Ramon Alonso had heard and disregarded tells of men that had paid their shadows as the price for certain dealings within the scope of the art, but he had never before considered the value of shadows. He saw now that to lose his shadow, and to come to yearn for it when it were lost, and to lose the little greeting that one daily had from one's kind, and to hear no more tattle about trivial things, to see smiles no more, nor to hear one's name called friendly, but to have the companionship only of shadowless things, such as that old woman and wandering spirits and dreams, might well be to pay too much for the making of gold. And well worn now, he decided that come what may, he would never part with his shadow. In his gratitude, he determined to ask the magician for some respite for that poor old woman from scrubbing his floors through the ages. And then his thoughts went back to his main purpose, to what metals were suited best for transmutation, and whether he could turn them into gold himself if the magician's price were, were too high. Other men had done it, why not he? And led towards absurdity by this delightful hope, his thoughts grew wilder and wilder, Tell they were dreams. The sun coming through the upper branches of trees fell on that spidery bed and woke Ramon Alonso. He perceived then a great gathering of huge oaks, seemingly more ancient than the rest of the forest, and the house was in the midst of them. It was a secret spot. He saw now that there was in a room a second window, but the little twigs had so pressed their leaves against it that no light entered there but a dim greenness. It was like hundreds of outturned hands protesting against that house. By such light as came through the southeastern window, he tidied himself, brushing off with his hand such cobwebs as he could. He did not draw back the curtains, deeming that if he took hold of a portion of one, it would come away from the rest. Nor did enough material remain to obstruct much of the light that came in through the trees. Then, being dressed already, he opened his door and descended the stairs of stone. Every narrow slit that lighted those dim stairs continued to show vast gathering of oaks that pressed close to the house, so close that Ramon, Alon so close that Ramon Alonso saw now what he had faintly heard overnight and not understood, that here and there great branches had entered the tower and been shaped as steps among the, among the steps of stone, making two or three hollower sounds amongst the tapping foot footsteps of such as use that stair. Upon stormy nights, the wooden steps swayed slightly. When Ramon Alonso had descended those steps, he came to passages amongst the darkness of rafters, which were like such nooks as children find under old stairs, only larger and stranger and dimmer, running this way and that, and guided by glimmers of light that shone faintly from a far window. He came at length to the hall, at whose other end was the old green door to the forest, and there in his black silk cloak, in the midst of the hall, the magician awaited him. 
He was standing motionless, and as soon as the young man saw him, the master of the art said, I trust you slept in comfort. For his studies allowed him leisure for courtesies such as these, but were too profound to permit of such intercourse with common material things as lifting the cobwebs, to see the state of the bedcloths that had mouldered so long upon his visitor's bed. As for the charwoman, she had sorrows enough watching the ages beating upon her frame to trouble what a mere thirty or forty years might do to the sheets and blankets. I slept admirably, signor. Ramon Alonso said, with a grace in his bow that is sometimes only learnt just as the joints and the muscles have grown too stiff to achieve it. I rejoice, said the magician. Master, said Ramon Alonso, would you deign to show me some unconsidered fragment of your wisdom, some saw having not to do with the deeper mysteries, some trifle, some trick of learning, perhaps the mere making of gold out of other dross that I may learn to study now or so in time be wise. For this, said the magician, pointing the way with a gesture. Let us go to the room that is sacred to the art. It's very dusty. Its very dust is made of books I've studied, and is indeed very redolent of lore than any dust in this wood. More redolent of lore than any dust in this wood. And if echoes die not at all, and some have taught, though others urge finality for all things, the spiders in its corners, whose ears are attuned to sounds that are lost to ours, Hear still the echoes of my earlier musings, whereby I unraveled mysteries that are not for the ears of man. There we will speak upon the graver matters. He led, and the young man followed, and again he was amongst beams of age-darkened oak, and twisty corridors leading into the gloom, which the shape of the magician before him rendered unnaturally blacker. They came to a black door studded with wooden knobs, upon which the magician rapped, and the door opened. They entered, and Ramon Alonso perceived at once that it was a magician's workroom, not only by the ordinary appliances or instruments of magic, but by the several sheets of gloom that seemed to come down from the roof, through the midst of the air, across the natural dimness of the room. The appliances of magic were there in abundance, stuffed crocodiles lying as thick as on lonely mud banks in Africa, dried herbs resembling plants that blossom in wanted fields, yet wearing a look that never was on any flowers of ours. Great twinkling jewels out of the heads of toads, huge folios, written by masters that had followed the art in China, small parchments with spells upon them in Persian, Indian, or Arabic, the horn of a unicorn that had slain its master, rare spices, condiments, and the philosopher's stone. These Ramon Alonso saw first as he came through the doorway, though what their purpose were, though what their purposes were, he scarcely wondered, and these were the things that always came to his memory whenever in after years he recalled that sinister room. As his eyes became accustomed to the dimness, more and more of the wares and tools of the magical art came looming out of the, came looming out of the dusk, while the magician strode to a high-backed chair at a lectern, on which a great book lay open, showing columns of Chinese manuscript. In the high-backed chair, the magician seated himself before the Cathayan book, and taking up a pen from an unknown wing, he looked at Ramon Alonso. Now, he said as though he came newly to the subject, or brought to it new acumen from having sat in that chair, what branch of the art do you desire to follow? The making of gold, responded Ramon Alonso. The formulae of all material things have been worked out, said the magician, and they have all been found to be vanity. Amongst the first whose formula failed before these investigations, revealing mere vanity, was gold. Yet, should you wish to study the art from its rudiments, from the crude transmutation of mere materials, of mere material things to the serious and weighty matters of transmigration, I am willing to give you certain instruction at first upon the frivolous topic of your choice. And it is not entirely without value, for by observing the changes in material things we chant sometimes an indication on indications that guide us in graver studies. But the whole of the way is long, even as the masters count time. Would you therefore begin from these early from these earliest rudiments? I would, said Ramon Alonso. No then, said he, that my fees are never material things, but are dreams, hopes, and illusions, and whatever, and whatever other great forces control the fortune of nations. 
Later, I will enumerate them. But while we study the mere transmutation of metals, I will ask no more than that which of all immaterial things most nearly pertains to matter, at one point actually touching it. My shadow, cried Ramon Alonso. The magician was irked by his guest's discovery of his fee, though he was indeed about to tell him. But he had a few more words to say first about the worthlessness of shadows, and the sudden disclosure of the point was not in accordance with his plans for conducting a bargain. And as many a man will do in such a case, he denied that he was about to ask precisely that. He soon, however, came round to it again, saying, "'And even so it were little enough to ask for my fee, which might well be larger were it not for my gratitude to your grandfather.' For a shadow of necessity shares the doom that overtakes matter, and is commoner far than faith, if all were known, and is of the least account of all immaterial things. Yet I need it, said Ramon Alonso. For what purpose? asked the master of the art. I shall need it when I go among the villages, he answered, or wherever I meet with men. Learn, said the magician, that aught that has value is to be treasured on that account, and not for the opinion of the vulgar and that which has no value is foolishly desired if its purpose be but to minister to the fickleness of the idle popular eye. Is my shadow valueless? asked Ramon Alonso. Utterly, said the master. Why then does your excellency demand it? Address me rather as your mystery, said the magician to gain time. Ramon Alonso apologized with due courtesy and conformed to the correct usage. I need it said his mystery, because they are those that serve me better when equipped with a shadow than when drifting vapidly in their native void. They have no other connection with earth except these shadows I give them, and for this purpose I have many shadows which I keep here in a box. But you, who were born on earth, have no need at all of a shadow, and lose none of, your, and lose none of our mundane privileges if you should give it away. And for all the wisdom of the magician, the young man remained less moved by his well-reasoned arguments than by the grief and, garru and garrulity of the charwoman. As he held his shadow and would not part with it, and the more the magician proved its uselessness, the more stubborn he became. And when the magician would not abate his fee, the young man determined to stay and study there rather than to return home empty-handed, and to bide his time, perhaps to come one day on the secret of transmutation, perhaps to grow so learned through his studies, that he might work out its formula for himself. Therefore he said, Are there no other mysteries that I may learn for a different fee? The master answered, There are many mysteries. For what fees? asked Ramon Alonso. These fairy, said the magician, according to the mystery. Your faith, your hope, half your eyesight, some illusion of value. I have many fees, as indeed there are many illusions. He would not give his faith, nor yet his hope, for that would be nearly as bad, and he had ever clung somewhat tenaciously to his illusions, as indeed we all do. "'What mystery?' Oh, sorry. "'What mystery?' he asked. "'Do you impart for half my eyesight?' "'The mystery of reading,' answered the master. Now, Ramon Alonso had such eyesight that he could count the points on a stag's head at five hundred paces, and deemed half would well suffice him. The magician, moreover, explained that it was not his custom to take that fee in advance, but that the length of his sight would diminish appreciably, as he mastered the intricacies of the mystery. This well suited Ramon Alonso, for he had ever wondered how the thoughts of men could lie sleeping for ages in folios, and suddenly brighten new minds with the mirth of men centuries dead. For the good fathers had not taught him this in their school, perhaps fearing that they would make their wisdom too common, if they recklessly made the laity free of its source. And believing, as many do, the wisdom is only a matter of reading, he thought soon to be on the track of the lore of those philosophers, who in former ages transmuted base metals to gold, and so came by what he sought without losing, and so come by what he sought, without losing his shadow. Master, said Ramon Alonso, I pray you teach me that mystery. The magician shut the book. The magician shut the book. To read Chinese, he said, I do not teach for this fee, for the Chinese script hides secrets too grave to be learnt at so light a cost. For this fee I teach only to read in the Spanish language. Hereafter, for other fees... Master, the young man said, I am well content. And then, with sonorous voice and magnificent gestures, 
the magician began to expose the secrets of reading. One by one he stripped mysteries, laying them bare to his pupil, and all the while he taught in that grand manner that he had from the elder masters whose lore he had been handed down. He taught the use of consonants, the reason of vowels, the way of the downstrokes and the up, the time for capital letters, commas, and colons, and why the J is dotted, with many another mystery. That first lesson in the gloomy room were well worthy of faithful description, so that every detail of the mystery might be minutely handed down. But the thought comes to me that my reader is necessarily versed in this mystery, and for that reason alone, I say no more on this magnificent theme. Suffice it that with all pomp and dignity due to this approach to the prime source of learning, the magician began to unfold the mystery of reading to the awed and wondering eyes of Ramon Alonso. And while they taught and learned, they heard outside in the passage the doleful sweeping of the shadowless woman that minded that awful house. Chapter 5 Ramon Alonso Learns of Ramon Alonso Learns of The Box before that day had passed, Ramon Alonso had learned the alphabet. He did not master it in one lesson, yet when the magician ceased all in the midst of his wonders in order that Ramon Alonso should have the midday meal, he felt that the pathway was already open that led to the boundless lands that made gay, made gay by the thoughts of the dead. And in those lands what spells might, be, might he not unravel, and amongst them the formula for the making of gold. If the magician ate, he ate secretly. But Ramon Alonso, going by his bidding to the room in which he had eaten and drunk overnight, found hot mills once more that awaited him. As he entered the room, he heard a small scurry of feet near the far door, but saw nothing. He ate, then guided by an impulse of youth, which is always curious until it is sure it knows everything, he began to roam through the darknesses of the house, in order to find who it was that served those meats. And the further he went, the lower the corridors ran, till he had to bend low to avoid the huge dark beams above him. Sometimes he came on towering doors in the darkness, and opened them and found great chambers, wanely lit by such daylight as came through the leaves of the forest, which everywhere were pressed against the windows. In these chambers were tapestried chairs, set out for a great assemblage, with ancient glories carved upon their frames, and dim magnificencies. But the cobwebs went from chair to chair, and covered all all of them over, and descending in huge draperies from the roof, cloaked and festooned the splendors that jutted out from the wall. He went from door to door, but found no kitchen, and all his quest was silent, but for the sound of his own feet. At last, as he turned back by the wandering corridors, he heard in the distance, before him, the work of the charwoman. She'd ceased her sweeping, and was scrubbing on stone. He walked to the sound of the scrubbing, and soon found her, the only living thing that he had met since he left the magician. She was in a passage, scrubbing at one stone upon which, as Ramon Alonso could see, she had, often, she had often worked before, for it was all worn with scrubbing. There was blood on the stone, but though years of scrubbing had hollowed it, the blood had gone deeper than the hollowing, so deep that Ramon Alonso asked her why she toiled at it. It was innocent blood, she answered. The young man did not even ask for that story. The house was so full of wonder, he asked instead what he had sought to find. Who serves the dinner? Imps, she said. Imps, said Ramon Alonso. Imps that he catches in the wood, she said, looking up from her work on the floor. How does he catch them? he asked. I know not, she said, with his spells like as not. He says they are no use in the wood, and so he catches them. Are there imps in the wood? asked Ramon Alonso. "'It is full of them,' she said. Turning to a more profitable matter, he asked, "'I am learning a mystery from the master.' "'For what price?' she asked quickly. "'What price?' "'Only half my eyesight,' he told her. "'Oh, your bright eyes,' she sighed. "'I can see so far,' he said, "'that there is a little... that that, that is a little matter. "'One must needs pay something for learning.' But she only looked wistfully at his eyes. "'When I've learned that mystery, I can find others for myself,' he said cheerfully. "'You know those jars of dust on his shelf with their names and writing upon them? I shall be able to read what dust they are.' And he would have told her many of the mysteries that seemed to lie open to him, but she interrupted him when he spoke of the jars, saying, 
I know nothing in that room. He has put a spell against me across the lintel so that I may not enter. Why? he asked, remembering the cobwebs and the great need of tidying. He has my shadow, she said, in a box in that room. Your shadow, he said, perturbed by the grief in her voice. I, she said, and he'll have yours there too. Not he, said Ramon Alonso. And the light of your eyes, she said sorrowfully. But Ramon Alonso, who already knew half the alphabet, was far more concerned with the unraveling of new wonders than he was with any price he should have to pay, and he turned from the charwoman's talk with a certain impatience to be once more engaged upon serious things. She sighed and went on with her work on the blood-stained stone. When Ramon returned to the room where... When Ramon returned to the room that no charwoman ever entered... He saw the magician awaiting him, standing beside a book that made light the secrets of reading. Once more the young man toiled at the mystery, and by evening the alphabet was clear to him. That which a day before held twenty-six secrets for him, and was as a barrier to roving thoughts, was now as an open path for them, leading he knew not whither. To him it seemed, as he finally mastered Z, that here was the very first and chiefest of mysteries. Since, since it opened a way for the living to hear the thoughts of the dead, and enabled the living in their turn to talk to unborn generations. Yet he shrewdly foreboded that if the magicians should spread their power too widely, it might not be well for the world. With evening, a natural darkness blending with the gloom of the room covered up all the mysteries, and the secrets of reading hid themselves. And with those secrets the glories of former days withdrew themselves further off, and lurked in dim nooks, that they had had in the dark of ages, that they had had in the dark of ages, in the dark of the ages. Then the master of the art bowed, and with a, and with a wide sweep of his arm, which both opened the door and indicated the way to it, he showed Ramon Alonso out, and followed and closed the door as magically as he had opened it. They came then once more to the room where the baked meats waited, and once more Ramon Alonso was seated alone. It seemed as though the master of the art would not permit himself to be seen, at least by Ramon Alonso, engaged on any work so mundane as that of eating. The young man suppressed his great satisfaction at the wonders already revealed to him. "'It is but the dew,' said the master, "'of any sprung from your grandfather, yet the whole art of reading is not compared with the practice of boar hunting. So I was once assured by that great philosopher.' He then withdrew leaving the young man all alone with his plans. But the more he planned to make gold, the more another plan came jutting into his mind, perpetually pushing away his original purpose. A plan fantastic enough, oh, sorry, a plan fantastic enough, a sentimental, generous, youthful plan, no less than a plan to find the magician's box and open it and get the, char and get the charwoman's shadow and give it to her to dance once more at her heels or float away over the buttercups. Yet it was all too vague to be called a plan at all. He had not seen the box. He had not yet seen the box. He rose then and went out to call her, but standing in the doorway remembered he knew not her name. So he went to the blood-stained stone, and she was not there, but nearby he found her pal. A while he wondered, then he went to the pal and kicked it noisily, knowing that folk's fears of their own property are often a potent lure. And deeming this to be well nigh all the property the poor old woman had, soon she came running. My pal, she said, clasping her hands. How shall I find your shadow? He said, give to give it back to you. My shadow, she wailed. It is in a box, and she uttered the word box as though boxes never opened, and anything put in a box must remain forever. Where is the key? He asked. The key? She said, bewildered by such a question. It opens to no key. She said this so decisively that Ramon Alonso felt he got no further here, but must bide his time till some opportunity shall, should come to that dark house. Meanwhile, he must know her name, and asked her that. Dockweed, she said. Dockweed, he answered. Did your godparents call you that? They were ill-disposed towards your parents. My godparents, she cried. Poor innocent souls, they did not call me that. My godparents, no. They call me by young and lovely name. They gave me one of the earliest names of spring. But that was long ago. I am Dockweed now. Who calls you Dockweed? He asked. He does, she said. 
but it is not your name. He is master here. But what is your own name? he asked. It was a young name, she said. I will call you by it. It is no use now. But what name did your godparents give you? he asked it again. They called me Anemone, she said. Anemone, he said. I will get you your shadow. It is deep in a box, she wailed. Shadowless then, she walked away from the lanthorn that he had brought from its hook on the wall and left on the floor near her pal. And he began to contemplate that it was easier to utter his gallant, confident words than to overcome the secrets of that dark house. Then he made many plans, which one by one appeared to be unavailing, as he was driven again to await the coming of opportunity. As he made and discarded his plans, he ascended the ancient stairway of stone and branches, and so came to his room. What tidying was possible in such a room had been done. The great cobweb, the great cobweb had been taken away from the bed, and the bedclothes had been smoothed as far as was possible when sheets and blankets had moldered into one. But the cobwebs amongst the curtains had not been touched, for if these had been torn away, the curtains would have come with them. The great rents, however, were partly filled with light flowers. More than this, the remnant of fabric could not have supported. He found a jug and basin of crockery with clear spring water in the jug, and knew that Dockweed, who had once been anemone, had drawn it for him in the cool of the wood. He washed with such washing as was, as was customary near the close of the Golden Age, then with loosened clothes lay down on the moldering bed. He did not extinguish the lanthorn, because the candle in it was down to its last half inch. Instead, he watched the shadows dancing with every drought, with every draught, and making huge bold leaps when the wick fell down and the flame was fluttering over a pool of grease. He watched their grace, their gaiety, and their freedom, and thought of Anemone's shadow, forlorn in the dark of the box. Surprisingly soon the blackbirds called through the wood, and Ramon Alonso saw that the night had passed. That day, as Ramon Alonso sat at his work, his mind was full of his plans to rescue the shadow, yet he worked hard nonetheless, for he thought to be a better match for the powers of the magician when he knew at least one of his mysteries. He felt at first a momentary compunction at thus arming himself with one of his adversary's weapons, but considered that the master was getting his price. Indeed, the gloomy room seemed unmistakably lighter than it had been the day before, and the thought came to Ramon Alonso that this slight brightness, if brightness it were, might be some of the light that was gone from his own eyes, with which the magician might be lighting his room. Yet, not for this brightness could he see among the dim shapes on the floor, under cobwebs behind the crocodiles, any sign of such a box as seemed likely to hold a shadow. So he bided his time and learned the mystery all day, and the master taught him well. That day he sought out the charwoman again, who was scrubbing still at the same stone. Anemone, he said, how shall I know the box in which he has hidden your shadow? It is long and thin, she said. Then she shook her head and went on with the scrubbing, for she despaired of him ever finding her shadow. He would not consult her despair, but went away to build plan after plan of his own and next day he discerned more closely. But even if the room were again a little brighter, he could not distinguish such a box as she said amongst the lumber that ran all round the wainscot. The gloom on the floor was still too thick, and there were too many crocodiles. He worked hard during those days, and soon was able to read the short words that, that had only one syllable, and still he worked on to unravel the whole of that mystery, of that mystery and lesser wonders gradually became clear to him, from things the magician said or from what he learned from Anemone. He learned how his food was baked by imps at a fire in the wood, little creatures of two feet high that could gamble and jump prodigiously. And he knew that the Hindu chants that haunted the air above the magician's house had been attracted from India, a wonder signifying little to us, who can hear those chants in Europe at the very moment, men sing them upon the Ganges. But curious at that time, even though it took upon, even though it took many years to lure them from India, so that all the songs that Ramon Alonso heard had been sung in youth by folk now withered with age, or by men and women long gathered to Indian tubes, he learned that the master's gratitude to his grandfather was genuine, and yet he thought he taught him the mystery of reading, not so much from gratitude, 
as from a desire to lure him to further studies, and so to further fees, luring him on and on till he got his shadow. And so the days went by, and now to read the words of only one syllable needed no more than a glance, while the many-syllabled words gave up their mysteries after little more than a brief examination. Till it seemed to Ramon Alonso that the past and the dead no longer held secrets from him. In such a mood he sought avidly for writing, beyond the big black script in the master's book, for he yearned to solve his own mysteries. But book, there was none in the house, outside the gloomy room that was sacred to magic. And then one day as he worked at some great four-syllabled word, there came a timid knock on the door to the wood, and the master passing out of his sacred room like a great black shadow, driven along dim walls by a draught, came with long strides to his doors. And there was one Peter, who worked in the garden of the tower and rocky forest, sweeping the leaves in autumn and trimming the hedge in spring, with a letter for Ramon Alonso from his father. And with stammered apologies and even tears for thus disturbing his door, he handed the parchment at arm's length to the magician. Chapter 6 There is Talk of Gulveres to the tower beside the forest rumor came seldom, for it was the last house that stood in the open lands. On the one side of the forest, on the one side, the forest cut it off entirely from converse with other folk, on the other only the strangest rumors that blew over the fields of men ever came so far as the tower. But many rumors from over the fields were reaching the tower now, and every one of them brought the name of Gulveres. Gulveres was a small squire of meager lands, twelve miles away from the tower, where he dwelt in a rude castle, and kept two men-at-arms. They, they knew his name at the tower, and knew that his pigs came sometimes to market at Aragona, and that their price was good, for the pigs of Gulveres were noted. But now they heard that the Duke of Shadow Valley, being upon a journey, would rest the night at his castle with Gulveres. Nor did this rumor fade, as such often did, they came so far over the fields, but others came to verify it. They told how the Duke had sent, messen they told how the Duke had sent messengers to Gulveres, praying him to receive him in ten days' time, when he would pass that way on his homeward journey. That was the very potent Magnifico, the second Duke of Shadow Valley, of whose illustrious father some tell was told in the Chronicles of Rodriguez. He ruled over those leafy lands that of late were held by his father, and had amongst many honors the perpetual right to stop any bullfight in Spain whilst he went to his seat, if it should be his pleasure to arrive late, and this he did by merely holding up his left hand, after one of his men-at-arms had sounded a call upon a small trumpet. So rare a privilege he exercised seldom, but it was his undoubted right, and that of his heirs after him forever. The news that so serene a prince was to visit Gulveres spread over the countryside as fast as gossips could tell it, and came like the final ripple of a spent flood, lapping at its last field to the walls of the tower that stood by the rocky forest. Gonsalvo, said the lady of the tower, addressing her lord, it is surely time the Signor Gulveres married. Gulveres? he said. He is past thirty-five, she answered. But his castle is small and dark, said he, and much of it bare rock. Who would live there with him? The Duke of Shadow Valley, she said, is to stay with him on a visit. And so said everyone who spoke of Gulveres, and many spoke of him now who had thought little about him hitherto. The lord of the tower and rocky forest reflected one silent moment. But he is a greedy man, he said, and will demand a dowry such as a man cannot give. It is not for us to punish his greed, she said. Those that cannot pay his dowry must go without him. But the coffer, he explained, that I have set apart for, Mir for Mirandola's dowry is empty. I saw it only lately. Ramon Alonso will fill it for us, she answered with as much faith in her husband's scheme as he himself had had when it was new to him. And her hopefulness set him pondering as to whether all was wholly well with his scheme. And in the end of his pondering... Although he said nothing to her, he decided, that the he decided that the time was come to renew his exhortations to his son. And for this purpose he sent Peter from the garden, with a message to a certain father Joseph, who dwelt not far away, asking him to come to the tower. 
for he needed Father Joseph in order to write a letter to Ramon Alonso. Not deeming this to be a suitable occasion on which to employ his own skill with the pen, the art of which he had learned a long while ago. And before Father Joseph came, he called Mirandola, and spoke with her in the same room as that in which he had had the long talk with his son, the room on the walls of which he hung his boar spears. Mirandola, he said, you must surely one day marry, and are now well past fifteen, and it is not seld and it not seldom happens that those that marry not when they may come soon to a time when none will marry them, so that they are spinsters all their days. What now think you of our neighbor Golveras, whom some have called handsome? A look like one of those flashes from storms too far for thunder lit for one moment Mirandola's eyes. Then she smiled again. Golveras, she said to her father. Yes, he said. He tends a little perhaps towards avarice. Or he thought he had seen the look in his daughter's eyes. But there are many worse sins than that, many worse if it be a sin at all, which it is by no means clear. But I will ask Father Joseph about that for you. I will ask him at once. For myself, I believe it to be no sin but a fault. But we shall ask, we shall ask. As you will, she said. You like him, then, said her father. He is not ill to look on. Two women not long since have called him handsome. He is a friend of the Duke of Shadow Valley. I like him not yet, she said. But happily if he come? Yes, said he. He shall come to visit us. If he come with his friend, said she. We cannot ask that, he said in gentle reproof. He could not bring the duke to visit us. Then he is not his friend, said Mirandola. Thus slightly was brushed away the claim of Golveras to the excited interest of all that neighborhood. The lord of the tower held up his hand to check her hasty utterance, while he thought of appropriate words with which to reprove her error, and when he found no suitable words at all, with which to show his daughter she was mistaken, and yet felt the need to speak, he said that he would consult Golveras on this, which he not intended to say, and afterwards conferring with his wife, they did not find between them a ready reason for refusing this curious whim of their dark-haired daughter, and in the end they decided to humor her. Judging it best to do so at such a time, though both of them feared the though both of them feared the arrival, if indeed he should ever come, of that dread magnifico and illustrious prince, the serene and potent Duke of Shadow Valley. Then Father Joseph came. He had walked scarce a mile, but he had hurried to do, but he had hurried to do the Lord of the Tower's bidding, and being now slender no longer, he panted heavily, and his tonsure and his tonsure shone warm and damp, so that there was a light about it. He held that before all else. He held that before all else are the things of the spirit, and in many ways he sought their triumph on earth, and for this purpose was ever swift to do the behest of the lord of the tower, who in that small neighborhood at the edge of the forest had such power as is permitted on earth, which Father Joseph hoped to turn towards heavenly uses. Therefore he came running. In what can I serve you? He said. The lord of the tower motioned him to a chair. Long ago, he said, I learned the art of writing in case that the occasion should ever arise on which I should be needful to use the pen. It is indeed a noble art, said Father Joseph. You did well to acquaint yourself with it. The occasion, however, said the other, did not arise. My pen hath therefore had but little practice save for such strokes as I may have sometimes made in idleness to see the ink run. In short, for want of this practice, my manner of writing is slow, while you, putting your pen daily to many sacred uses, have a speed with it that is no doubt swift as thought. "'Tis but a poor pen and an aged hand," said Father Joseph, "'but such as it is." "'Now I have need of a letter to be written in haste,' continued the Lord of the Tower." for which I deemed your pen to be suited beyond the pins of any. And if you will write what I shall say, the work will be speedily accomplished. Gladly will I, answered Father Joseph, his breath already beginning to come more easily from the rest he had had in the chair. Gladly will I. And he brought forward an inkhorn that hung at his girdle, and drew from under his robe a roll of parchment that was curled round a plume, for he had all these things upon him. 
and as soon as the lord of the tower had lent him a knife, he had shaped the end of the quill for a pen in a moment, and pared it, and all was ready. These things he took to a table, and dipped the pen, and was readier to write than Gonsalvo was to think. For this was the difficulty about the letter that he desired to send his son. He wished to exhort him to continue his studies with a redoubled vigor. Such a message as Father Joseph would smile to hear, glowing for some while after with an inner satisfaction. But then again, those studies were nothing less than the black art, and the, pro and the product of them no ordinary lucre, but a dross that might well seem to Father Joseph to come hot from the hands of Satan. How was he to ask that? How was he to ask that some of this straw should be sent full soon, for the righteous purpose of settling his daughter comfortably in the holy bonds of wedlock, without sh without shocking the good man by too open a reference to the method of its man without shocking the good man by too open a reference to the method of its manufacture? It cost him some moments of thought, and night puzzled him altogether. Then he began thus, and the pen of Father Joseph scurried behind his words. My dear son, I trust that you apply yourself diligently to your tasks, and that you are already well advanced in your studies, and, in especial, in that study which I most commended to you. That coffer which I showed you the day before you left is in no better state than it was then. We urgently require somewhat that will cover the satin lining, which is in no such ill repair. Your studies will have acquainted you with what materials best suited for this purpose, <coughs> and you will be able to acquire some of it more easily than we and to send us sufficient we have, a neighbor, we have a neighbor shortly coming to visit us and he will doubtless see the coffer and should he see the satin lining in its present state of ill repair it would shame us and Mirandola hasten therefore to send us some of that material that will best cover it and the covering will need to be thick for this neighbor has shrewd eyes. Your mother sends her love and Mirandola. Your loving father, Gonsalvo of the Tower and Rocky Forest. What studies does your worthy son pursue? said Father Joseph. He is studying to take his proper place, said Gonsalvo, learning to be a man. He is being taught such things as concern his sphere in life, fitting himself for such responsibilities as will fall on him learning to take an interest in the proper things, studying to concern himself with the things that matter. I apprehend, said Father Joseph. But still the Lord of the Tower felt the more phrases yet were required of him, and he poured out all those he knew which, although having no meaning, could yet be introduced into conversation. There are far, there are far fewer of them then than there are now, so that he soon came to an end of them, but then he quoted proverbs and popular sayings and such circumlocution as had come to him, as had come down to him after serving various needs in former ages. I apprehend, said Father Joseph. Then the Lord of the Tower took the parchment and sealed it up with his seal, and Father Joseph sat there rubicund, affable, blinking, a study for anything rather than thought. Yet years of familiarity with incomplete confessions had given him a knack with the loose ends of parts of stories that enabled him to unravel them almost without thinking. This he had done already with the story now before him, but he desired to be sure, for he was a careful man. I have myself, he said, some material that might line a coffer, a very antique leather, or some damask that... No, no, said the Lord of the Tower, I should not think of depriving you of these fair things. And Father Joseph knew from his haste to refuse this offer, and his eagerness to send the letter quickly, that he had indeed unraveled the story of Ramon Alonso. Behind that beneficent smile that lingered after his speaking, he pondered somewhat thus, so far as thoughts may be overtaken by words. The black art, an evil matter. The earning of gold by dark means, perhaps even the making of it. Let us see to it that it be put to righteous uses, so that it be not entirely evil, both end and origin. And he began to plan uses for some of the gold that Ramon Alonso should so, should so sinfully earn, blessed and holy uses, so that not all should be evil about this wicked work, but that good should manifest, but that good should manifestly, ugh, but that good should manifestly arise from it, 
like the flower blooming in April above the dark of the thorn, and the powers of darkness should see and be brought to shameful confusion. Thank you so much for joining me on my stream today, or for watching the VOD either on Twitch or on YouTube. Uh, my Twitch handle is BeardedMJ if anybody wants to follow. And thank you so much for listening.